few weeks ago, I was out taking a walk, and I noticed one of those shifting billboards, the ones that rotate through images. After some advertisements for some fancy watches, the next shift caught my eye. And this was odd, because normally I don't really pay attention to such things. But this time it was different. In fact, what was being presented to me was the first time I had ever beheld such a sight under the sky, which is to say, not online. It was a larger-than-life image of a woman, markedly obese, representing the skincare product maker Dove. Under her portly mass, I could read some of the platitudes that one typically only encounters online, about the high percentages of women who were victims of body shaming, and that beauty comes in all shapes and sizes. Now, as I said, I'm familiar with some of this rhetoric from the online environment, almost exclusively online, in fact. But this was being presented to the normal consumer who probably does not spend copious amounts of time online. Seeing this sort of thing for the first time in real life, I must say, I found it rather fascinating. Usually when we think of advertising and marketing, we think of standards of well-established norms, writ large, being applied to the marketing campaign. For example, it's not infrequent when seeing advertisements for clothing to see models or model-esque people wearing the clothes, and the same holds true for jewelry accessories, and any number of things, range from cars to travel. Generally speaking, whatever might be presented, making use of conventionally attractive people to help you in the presentation has repeatedly shown itself to be useful and profitable. It would seem, therefore, on the face of it, that running an ad with an obese woman for a skin product, of all things, where the product is directly tied to one's appearance at first glance, would be some sort of joke or perhaps a marketing stunt something else entirely. Why would a company selling products meant to enhance physical aesthetics and appearance do this? The answer is not simple. Part of it is simply the social currency of our time, which is virtue signaling. Individuals do it to garner social capital online, and larger collective entities do it for the very same reasons, and also, and perhaps more importantly, because it helps them ensure a degree of safety and maintain public image. Inclusivity, in the sense, extends to virtually every potential group that may be excluded, and one could leave it at that, as it is entirely plausible that maybe Dove and other companies are just trying to cover their tracks, and I'm certainly some of them do, as no one wants to experience the fecal storm as some blow-up on Twitter or enough social disrepute that the brand might suffer from it. However, in the case of Dove and other brands, I think it goes simply beyond covering their backsides. As of the year 2017, in the U.S., for example, 35 million women were obese, and 54 million were overweight. And fast-forwarding to the current year, the numbers are probably even higher, meaning that likely over 90 million American women are either overweight or obese. In Germany, 24% of women are either overweight or obese. The reality is that there is an emergent customer demographic in the extremely overweight and or obese population. And a company that sells skincare products, i.e., image and branding products, would be remiss if they did not seek to capitalize on these demographics. It might be true that catering to the more traditional demographic of relatively fit and in shape would likely still be the best general marketing strategy. But as the rates of obesity go up and up, so too must a company such as Dove adapt. There's another element at play, however, when it comes to women. And that is that frequently feels come before the reels, which is to say that whatever the underlying reality might be, the desire for emotional consensus will override anything that seems to contradict the reality, which is why you'll likely never encounter body positivity or talk of so-called fat shaming in male quarters, because men neither desire to obfuscate certain things, nor could one ever muster the public interest to campaign on the behalf of men even if men wished it to be so. It's not entirely clear when the term fat or body shaming first came into existence for a number of reasons. In terms of both health and appearance, excessive body fat is simply not viewed as optimal. So disapproval of the state has probably been around for quite some time, if not since humans had first stepped onto the scene, though back then it would have been nigh impossible to be grossly overweight or obese in that environment. Now, of course, This is the point where certain people will jump in and claim that 
human aesthetics are constantly changing and shifting and are entirely dependent on society and culture. The reality is that in no time and in no place was there a people or a culture that revered obesity as being desirable, attractive, or goal-worthy. And this is the place where so-called cultural relativists will come in and tell you about Rubens paintings and Rubens women, i.e. portly and fat women. But the problem here is that the interpretation of this art is that this was the aesthetic standard of the time was reflected of societal trends at the time, but that's not entirely accurate. Artists in the Renaissance and in the early modern period worked on commission, and the people who could afford to pay for paintings were therefore wealthy and typically of greater portliness than your average person because they could afford to eat excessively. This was not an aesthetic standard, but rather a wealth standard, and not reflective of cultural or societal trends much less aesthetics. Whilst it's true that many people might have envied the nobility for their wealth and ability to afford large quantities of food, it's not at all clear that this was considered a sexually desirable standard. There are many unusual trends and interests to be found in the world of aesthetics across cultures in the world, from elongated necks to gigantic stretched out earlobes. Being obese and fat is not one of them. So what is ultimately driving all of this? We've already covered some of the more obvious aspects in the current socio-political cultural meta. People and companies pay lip service to certain trends in order to cover their behinds and to virtue signal. But there's a far larger factor in all of this. Consumption. I alluded to this before, but I think most people just don't understand how much female participation in consumption guides certain trends in the market. Customers have a range of underlying motivations triggering their shopping and consumption behaviors, but there are essentially two types of shopping consumption motives. One is utilitarian, the conscious pursuit of intended consequence, essentially meaning you're shopping to get something done, and two, the hedonic, related to intrinsic and emotional responses. In other words, you're shopping because you enjoy it or love it. And men, tend to follow a utilitarian, more logic-based approach. You need to tell them why they should buy your products and why it makes sense for them to purchase it. Get to the point quickly, focus on the products, and use active statements that demonstrate value. Women are mostly hedonic shoppers. To reach and engage women, you'll have to create an emotive shopping experience that resonates with them. A purely functional approach can fall flat pretty quickly. Women want to know more about you, your brand, the lifestyle you sell, and how your products are going to make them feel. Women make decisions on a more emotional level, whereas men approach decision-making with facts and data. Now, once a consumer recognizes the need for a certain product or service, information needs to be gathered and processed to evaluate alternatives. And it's been shown that men and women differ dramatically in their strategies for information processing and decision-making. Women tend to be more comprehensive and take both subjective customer views and objective information in consideration, while men tend to favor objective information, the model to make the speed over subjective information. Now this doesn't necessarily mean that men don't value the opinions and experiences of others, but rather the approach is different. So men do use the experiences of others with a product if they're interested in it and to form their own opinion, but women would want to know the reasons and motivations to understand why others purchased an item and whether their situation is comparable before considering it and their decision making. Is it trendy? Are other women doing it? Women want to feel important. Men just want to get out fast. And a final point. Women do hold crucial purchasing power. In fact, women drive 70 to 80 percent of all consumer purchasing through a combination of buying power and influence. This sheds light on why Dove or any other business would want to market to a set of female customers that do not meet the normative standard. The women in question still represent a substantial sector of the consumer base, and given the numbers cited regarding obesity, there are more than enough female customers who will purchase their products, and more to the point, as mentioned above, women drive the vast majority of all consumption. An interesting aspect to this is the health factor. Most of the claims made by body positivists and pro-obesity activists run counter to a widely agreed upon medical consensus. And 
evidence related to negative health outcomes associated with obesity and being grossly overweight. And on the face of it, this is not something new. Back in the day, smoking was actively endorsed by some doctors in marketing campaigns and the like. But eventually, enough data had been compiled to show that smoking was just a bad option and thoroughly unhealthy. And even though smoking manufacturers pushed hard against warnings and measures in terms of pure marketing, they lost. What is fundamentally different about, say, smoking versus obesity is the feeling aspect. Most of the people campaigning for body positivity are women. And as alluded to earlier, feelings and feeling good about yourself are an important aspect of advertising when it comes to women. And the very fact that women are primarily promoting this makes them unassailable. Because the demographic being targeted is explicitly female, an entirely different approach is taken with the issue, in contrast to smoking, and therefore is far more politicized. Yes, there were political issues surrounding smoking, but never of the sort that exists today. And with respect to so-called body shaming and the push for quote-unquote fat acceptance, since feelings are prioritized, the general health message is likely to fail to get through. It is another step on the way to prioritizing feels over reels and amplifying the current insanity of clash of reality and feeling that we tend to observe throughout our current society. And as the obesity epidemic grows, the political divisions increase and it all becomes interwoven. I suspect going forward, all manner of strange advertising avenues will be pursued, even some of the sort that we cannot even imagine in the so-called current year, with new versions of Tess Holiday and the like leading the charge for their respective causes. I cannot wait, and hopefully neither can you. Please hit the like button. Please subscribe if you're not yet subscribed. Please share the video. Hit that bell icon to be informed of forthcoming videos because YouTube does not inform my subs, usually. And if I'm still alive, I'll check you out later. May the gods watch over you. Take care. If you liked this video, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you enjoy my content, please consider making a donation or becoming a patron. Thanks for watching.